with the class, so I'll just officially launch it. Um, so uh, welcome to CPT 371, um, class on software product management. My name is Nathaniel Lazio, and I'll be your instructor uh, for the term. Um, this class has a special place within the software engineering curriculum, and in fact, in the in the computer science curriculum more generally, a, a distinctive uh, um, place as well. Um, uh, this is a class which will stand out in your memory uh, following graduation, um, and hopefully in a good way. As a class that brings together a tremendous amount of, of practical principles, practices, processes, and tips for you to perform as a high quality software engineer on medium and large scale software teams. Um, this is probably the first course of your uh, time here in the program, which does require uh, intimate partnership with uh, and delivery of value for external stakeholders. Okay? So in this course, you will be required to partner with a, uh, a stakeholder and um, deliver a product for them. And you will do so in larger teams that are uh, quite typical of large areas of industry, that is teams um, upwards of eight people, um, uh, sometimes as large as 12, um, uh, for delivery of these tools. And this will bring to the fore certain issues having to do with team coordination, team, um, team subdivision of responsibilities, accountable positions, and adherence to a set of, uh, set of principles and practices that will make sure that the information about what's going on in the team, of what's planned, what's in place right now, is not trapped in just a few people's heads, but gets spread throughout the team for effective testing, for effective software development, for effective planning, for effective communication with the stakeholders, and many other purposes. Um, so this course, at the end of the term, I hope you will uh, recognize the value conferred as have previous generations of students. Um, and I look forward to working with you to deliver a successful course. I want to note that this course um, focuses on this area of software project management, hence its name. Um, the delivery of effective projects, not just by the project manager, but the whole team that makes a successful project uh, possible. Um, this art of directing and coordinating human and, and in some degrees material resources, uh, uh, for example, test, uh, computers or smartphones used for testing, et cetera, to, to meet this iron triangle, to stay within this iron triangle. Iron triangle involving, anyone know the iron triangle? Okay, um, on the one side of it is cost, the other side of it is time, and the other side of it is value, which is composed both of extent of features on the one hand and quality with which those features are delivered on the other. And much of the challenge in software as well as other areas of project management is staying in a way that reaches all three goals, all three all three of these vertices of this triangle successfully achieves them. Getting any one is trivial. Getting any two is doable. Right? Um, uh, given enough cost, uh, or given, given enough flexibility in terms of value delivered, we can do things within cost and at a defined time. Shed unnecessary features, implement them in a quick and dirty way, and we can probably stay within cost and time balance. Time and value. Well, if you have to do things within a defined time and, and uh, to a certain degree of value, often by premium options, hiring the very best software developers and, and teams, you can often muddle your way through it. I say muddle because adding people to a late software project per Brooks Law often makes it later. Um, cost and value, similarly, if, if we want to stay within cost and offer a certain amount of value, given enough time, I suspect anyone in the room could probably deliver an appropriate project, given enough time. 
it's really hitting all three that, of this that's really hard. That's, that's, the, that's the really challenging part of effective self-development. And of course, when we're in accountable projects where we have to deliver for a client, maybe in a consulting form or internally it's delivering IT products for elsewhere in the company, or whether it's a mass market product, an app being launched, a website service being launched, we don't have the choice of needing to address all three. Of course we do. And this is what makes it hard. It's easy to meet, comparatively easier to meet two. Three, that's, that's really challenging. Okay. Um, and this course will tap a, a wide range of skills to make this possible. Even within your team, not, not to mention communicating with the stakeholder, um, within the, the core team, you're going to need communication skills that are effective. Yes, it will need technical skills, for sure, to pull this off. Skills not just limited to software development, but to testing as well, for example. To effective, to effective mocking so you can test out small areas of the project without testing the entire project at once for, for effective unit testing. You also need good decision-making skills. How to handle that team member who's been out of touch now for all too long, and you've been counting on to deliver this thing for later this week. Fish or cut bait? Do we, do we still rely on that, that they'll come home in the lurch? Do we somehow substitute someone in? And can we anticipate these problems long ahead of time so we can fly ahead of the plane and head off these issues? Problem solving skills are a key part of this course, and interpersonal skills. Your project will crash and burn if you have a lot of conflict going on there. I will have seen it before. On the other hand, the best projects are ones for the ages here. Um, several corporate projects have been spun out of this course. Teams have been gelled in such a way they want to work together on a persistent basis long after, after university. <laughs> to this day, some of those teams are together working on problems. And that is, in no small part, to good chemistry and good sense of how to diffuse potential conflicts, uh, align people's incentives, etc. And leadership skills, not in a Napoleonic sense, but in the sense of often motivating people, having a, not, not setting down things in an authoritarian way, but having a authority that comes from, from listening and from knowledge. Um, so, you know, we're hoping here to ensure your projects in this class go smoothly, but the, the skills you'll be building are ones um, that work uh, throughout your career. And we're gonna be covering a, a large number of, of, of uh, topics in this. I'm gonna be going through a set of best practices that will underwrite these. But as time allows, we'll get to uh, many, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps all of these. These will include, perhaps first amongst your classes, to really try to drive this home, a lot of discussion on testing. Testing at multiple levels. Unit test, integration test, you know, full system test, uh, and acceptance test. Um, and those testing different levels of, of the system and different needs. Peer reviews, this is uh, mandatory. All, uh, uh, every deliverable, all five of them for this term, will require formal inspections in your team. With defined roles. With under, understanding ahead of time what you'll be reviewing and circulation of the review package at, ahead of time with notes being taken, what goes on during the meetings, and follow-up, that things are actually fixed. So peer reviews will also be part of the daily life of the project. They should be. Informal peer reviews, uh, depth peer desk checks, where you invite someone to look over code, or you engage in peer programming. Uh, risk management will be a key thing, and many other features, including continuous integration. So why do you care about this? Maybe, maybe you're a uh, hardcore coder, you live in the bits and bytes, why, why should you care about this? Well, the fact is that the best delivery of effective project, of effective value these days in software is delivered in the project. You will either 
working projects or like so many of my colleagues help manage projects, um, sell software projects, found your own companies, and have to deliver value within those projects. And poor management is responsible for the failures of, of most projects. It's not fundamentally technical issues. It's poor managerial judgment responding to issues, failing to fly ahead of the plane with respect to risk management, failing to anticipate and proactively head off issues to put in place contingency plans, put in place mitigation measures to head, head off other risks, et cetera. And really, even if your interests lie thoroughly on the, 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 the software, most technical aspects of the software, the sort of skills you'll learn in this project will both will let you take those uh, uh, take those skills uh, to a whole nother level and help you realize your technical visions and help your career. For many of you, these these will be foundational material. The truth is, software engineering has increasingly evolved from a field which which focuses in the small on solving minute little problems. To, to a sphere where larger and larger systems are being composed. We're not hacking together, you know, just the very fastest algorithm to sort, sort these things or to, uh, to solve this small algorithm in isolation. We're building large multi-platform systems that run between my smartphone, maybe wearables, <coughs> websites online, etc. It's all integrated, you know. Um, and increasingly, the real problems in delivery of those systems, many of those problems lie in project coordination. It's dealing with the complexity of these systems in terms of coordinating dozens of people delivering the system, recognizing that the people building the websites are probably quite different from the people building the apps, the, the smartphone apps, probably quite different in turn from those maintaining the databases. And Yet, you've got to coordinate all of these to deliver these large-scale systems. And so increasingly, the real issues, the, the real blockers, the real bottlenecks have turned into t factors in the human sphere. So I want to briefly run down just some administrative. I just want people to be aware of what you're dealing with with this class, the vision of, uh, of marks, et cetera, before we dive into some of the expectations in terms of best practices to let your project succeed and avoid them crashing and burning. Okay. So the course materials for this site are on Moodle. And I expect that everyone in the room probably has experience with Moodle. If you don't, come up and talk with me afterwards. Okay? Uh, but if you go to Moodle, you should find, if you click on my courses and you register to this course, you should find a, you know, this list and you can go to it now if you like. Um, so uh, on the Moodle site, you will find a set of materials here. Um, and they are just you know, a small set of seeds for what will become a very much larger site. And I'll be posting things there as soon as tonight for other key materials, including project proposals. We'll start being posted tonight. Um, there is a course outline. I would invite any of you to follow along, as I mentioned some requirements right now. Um, I also include a video playlist. Some of you may have noticed um, that I'm recording this lecture as I do for all my lectures. And while I can't guarantee there won't be some snafu in any given lecture, I have approximately two to 3,000 videos online right now, and these will soon drop, okay? So I will try within a day or two after each lecture to make sure it's posted to Moodle. Um, so that, amongst other things, you can review the material or um, catch uh, some of my points uh, more clearly. Please do not use this to avoid coming to class because that will tremendously shortchange yourself and your learning, your project team members very materially, and your chance of passing the Okay, um, so I do have on there a course description that includes an academic honesty statement which is of great importance and a preliminary schedule, including day-by-day -day coverage and guest lectures, etc. Okay, so you're all here, you know when the lectures are, tutorials are Tuesday at 4 to 5 p.m. and they are for varied purposes. I will join you for some tutorials. I recognize 
recognize that this is unusual, but this is an unusual course. Um, they will be used uh, critically for a lot of team meetings, where I, myself and the TA may also join them. Okay? Uh, office hours, I will hold after each session of this course, wherever possible, so that's two days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, immediately following, you can come up and talk with me and you know, we can continue to talk back to my office, uh, 254.4. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, if you need to meet me outside of that, uh, please write me uh, or talk with my colleague, Christine Hillis, who's in the office right next to me, and uh, we can book you in. But uh, with two hours anticipated, four office hours each week, um, hopefully that will be enough to cover most of the needs that, that come up. Um, okay, so within this uh, class, there's going to be uh, a strong emphasis of qualitative and, and qualitative components. Um, uh, I will have, uh, certainly there's the final exam for the class. Um, we will have pop quizzes in class. This is one of the ways you shortchange yourself if you don't come to class, because the pop quizzes will be delivered in class. Okay. And uh, they'll be fairly simple things. Marked generously. Um, I've been known to give marks for you to spell your name correctly. Um, and uh, frankly speaking, a lot of the goals here is to motivate you to come to class so that you meet with your classmates uh, for the meeting that's involved in class. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, um, uh, but it's to make sure you're you, you just don't go offline in a way that. Uh, the disconnects, and which is often a, a, a problem and often a fatal problem um, in terms of uh, prospects of passing the class. I have a set of books which um, cover collectively a fair bit of what's talked about, but they're not means exhaustive. This software project survival guide is pretty darn good. Uh, it's a bit dated now, but um, but but good, and it covers a lot of the basics. Um, there's also a book on. Um, uh, on project software engineering uh, that I may additionally add to the syllabus, which has come to my attention. Okay. Um, an important part of this class is participation. I'll come to the marking rubric in a bit. But um, uh, I, I would, I expect to see, and I look forward to seeing, students interact in whatever form. I recognize people are comfortable with different forms. Some of you may answer questions. Some may feel comfortable in class. Some may feel class comfortable talking with you one-on-one -on -one afterwards. Um, others may want to, you know, interact with me on, on, on an appointment basis, and that's okay. Um, any of those things are fine. I would encourage people to speak up in response to my questions, even if they are concerned their answer is wrong. That's not the issue. The issue is to get a dialogue going and to get you thinking about a lot of the issues. Okay. Um, uh, but I need to get to know each of you, okay? Um, this, this is about typical for this class in terms of size, but normally I try to know each and every person because I need to give you a mark for participation. So I want to know, okay, who is that person? What role did they play? And I'm reading what people in your project are saying you did and what you claimed you did as part of it. I'm hearing you present in presentations. And I want to know each one of you, okay? So please be encouraged to, to help me uh, do that. So state your name when you, when you speak up, okay? And please interrupt my presentation. Please interrupt, okay? Um, okay, Moodle sites, lecture slides, uh, et cetera. Um, okay, as I noted, I'm recording these videos. Uh, these videos, uh, uh, these are screencast videos. We, we don't have a recourse to them. A video recorder here to capture my wanderings. Um, I can't necessarily pick up questions with this. I, I think normally questions are too soft coming from the audience to pick it up. I'll try to remember to repeat it so it gets recorded, okay? Um, so that people listen would, would know. Okay, here's the marking rubric. Pop quiz is 15%. Okay, in class, in class delivery almost exclusively. 
traditionally. I'm, I, this semester, I think I may ask you to work on some things ahead of class. If I do so, it's a pretty strong indication you can be handing it in tomorrow as part of class or you know the, the next class or whatever. So the point is, um, the pub quizzes may come a bit of, announced a bit ahead of time sometimes to get you thinking about it. That's great. The phases of the term project, there's five of them. Each of them will be worth 7%. Five incremental deliverables. Why do we build incremental deliverables? We've got these stakeholders. Why, why not just have one big delivery for all 35 of these? Why, why, have, why have incremental ones? Anyway, why do we build things incrementally? Yeah. Great, so we can get feedback, and also feedback from the stakeholder. Okay. Another reason. Um, uh, if, uh, if things change over the realize that the design isn't going to work out based on something that's come up at a later stage, then you can at least assess that and kind of take the same thing move forward. Yep, yep. So you you can know, okay, look, this is gonna take a lot longer than we anticipated, and bring that to the stakeholder, for example. Your name is Will. Will. Um, any others? Yeah. Hi, Sam. Uh, to actually let the stakeholder know how things are going, did they give so, you input that their requirements have changed? You need to adapt to that. Yeah. They live in a changing world, too. Maybe the organization is thinking about merging with another company. Maybe maybe they just started a new line of business. Um, maybe they're, they've acquired uh, a new type of software for a different area that needs to interface with us. Lots of reasons for that. Um, there's many other reasons as well. It's actually a lot easier to estimate in small pieces. We can fool ourselves really easily when we're estimating a whole swath of things. Turns out it's much easier to test and debug if we have fewer things which have changed for delivery. We could see, we can narrow down where that problem might have come in because we've you know we've mucked up less uh, fewer lines of it of uh, the. Uh, of the code base. Um, uh, we can better understand prioritization once we have something to show to the stakeholder and they look at it, often they get a very a clearer sense, even without changed needs, of where their priorities are different. They actually see something tangible and they say, oh, that's good enough. I thought we'd need more of it. That actually looks looks so good. Let's, let's try this other thing. So they actually can can interact with something in a way that clarifies their, um, you know, their prioritization. It turns out there's many other reasons that we'll talk about, but a lot of it is, has to do with learning and learning more quickly what things um, are changed. And finally, we always have something in hand, right? If they say, oh man, I need this a lot sooner than I thought, you've got something to give them, right? You've got something tangible. And so it is here, build something tangible to give them, I trust. Um, okay, now in addition to that, let's suppose your project, like a few in the 13 years I've been teaching this course, suppose your project engages in flailing behavior. Suppose it crashes and burns. We, we have many reasons that projects have gotten into trouble. Only a few have really crashed and burned. Um, there's some memorable stories. Um, uh, those will come out. Those will come out. Um, uh, but suppose it does. You still have a good chance to recoup a lot of insight if you have a post-mortem that basically reflects on the whole experience. How could we have headed this off? How could we have known that it was going south you know, earlier and responded to it? What best practices could we have put into place that would have let us avoid this whole set of issues. Basically thoughtful reflection on what could have been done better, how you could have known sooner uh, about the problem itself. And this reflects one of the principles of this course. The issue is not that making mistakes is bad. The issues of making mistakes and not effectively learning from them is, is, is a loss, is a, is, is a bad thing. If you can take a mistake, learn from it how to avoid that mistake in the future, 
or at least had it detected if you've made the mistake so you can respond to it sooner and cause less damage, you have actually made a step forward net, net from that. And uh, the postmortem is a chance to do that. So be aware that those two together are 50% of the mark. You will not pass this course if you just go off and treat the project as a minor thing. But even if the project has terrible problems, you can, you can actually get a good mark individually by putting in your best effort and showing dedication to leadership, showing, showing a, a genuine attempt to work with it, and showing learning from it. Okay. Um, final exam is 30%. I can't do anything. That's rules you know, and university rules for other universities. Okay. And individual participation, uh, 5%. An important 5%. Okay. It also factors in an important way into how much you get of these shares, this 50%. If you are, if you are putting in a lot of, not just effort, but care into, into the term project, you will be rewarded more than the person who's next to you nominally in the same project, but is kind of slack and kind of letting it slide. So, so just be aware that I'm not going to just give everyone on the project equal okay. I'll be asking you for feedback. And I get a pretty good pulse on what's going on. And we hear from you many times a term in class, but we also will be inviting you to review sessions where we're going over your handouts. And I'll be seeing what's going on. And we, and we also get comments at the end of the semester. What do people do. I get to learn what each person claims they did and then what other people say they did. And, uh, and we, we get a really good sense of what the divisions are. So be aware that if you show leadership, if you really put in the efforts, you will be rewarded. Even if your project is poorly, you can do very well. Very well. Okay? So, uh, and learning from mistakes is part of that, being open about them. Okay? Um, uh, don't hand in your projects late. There's not time to do so. Project deliverables. Every, again, five of them. What that means is that you're going to be handing these in roughly every two to three weeks through the term. Non stop. It's just grinding for. There's some accommodation for you know, the break and so on. And I'm certainly, if, if a student's in crisis, they have a family issue that can't be worked out, they're really ill, come talk with me. I'm glad to, to hear these things. But you don't have time to sort of hand it in late this time. You'll get even later. So hand me time box it. Hand me what you got at that time. It's another reason to build it incrementally, right? Um, OK. Um, this. Academic honesty tends to be less of an issue here because these are all custom-built projects. <laughs> You're not going to get very far by trying to copy something online. Um, and um, you know, if you do use sources, if you do take code from other sources, say that, document it. This algorithm was taken from here. Or this design element was taken from there. That's fine. It's fine. Just document, attribute it. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, class, class projects, and I, I emphasize success is judged both in terms of learning and of you know, technical value and delivery. Okay? You've got to take this seriously. It, it may sound like a heck of a lot of fun to be working on these projects, but it can go bad in a big way very quickly. You could say, you know, it all looks great on paper, but you know, conflicts come up between people, the technologies you thought work together so well, just don't play together nicely. You're having trouble getting past this barrier. You've been writing things to the tech staff here in the department, they haven't been getting back to you on time. There's all sorts of ways things can go bad. And you gotta be, have a sense of ownership of this. Fly ahead of the plan. You gotta be looking, where do we have vulnerabilities? What can we put in place as a backup scheme? For people get sick. I would venture that a large fraction of this class will get sick sometime between now and December. I certainly will not do my part to pull that along, but, but I, I suspect a lot of people will experience illness at one point or another, not perfectly, et 
acceptable and understandable, but your teams have to realize that, right? If you have a one person who's the build, build person, the build master, one person, you have a low bus number. What do I mean by bus number, anyone? It means the number of people have to be hit by bus for the project to crash. <laughs> they come to a complete, it's, it's a term you hear in, in the company's downtown. It's a bus number. I uh, hear the company's worldwide. You have a low bus number, you will get in trouble. So you put in place plans. What's something you could do to mitigate that plan, to, to head that off, to, to make yourself less vulnerable? What's that? Low <laughs> uh, um, Good luck to you. And, uh, uh, you work at the police uh, station. I'll see you in the, see you in the, the cell site. Yeah. Uh, pair programming? Yeah, pair programming is a great example at, at, a, at a less uh, facetious level. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a technique to spread knowledge. It's also a technique to enhance, enhance quality right then because the two different people you know, will spot different issues, different errors, et cetera. So it might head off issues, but it spreads knowledge. Shadowing people, having someone shadow the person who's build master, sit next to them, see how they do things, how they configure things, just in case. This is a good, you know, good technique. Um, very good technique. Have a rotating person. Maybe the build master for for time one is for the incremental deliverable one, and maybe they alternate with another build master. So each of them is fairly up to speed on a, so lots of different ways. It's about taking ownership, ladies and gentlemen. This is not about, you know, just saying, what the hell, lightning struck and our project crash. Um, that doesn't Why do you have, you know, a 300 meter metal pole sticking up attracting lightning, you know? What have you done to leave yourself vulnerable and unnecessarily vulnerable? If, if problems occur, how could you know about them as soon as possible so you can react to them? Having good communication with um, how can you head things off from happening by having fallback strategies, by having, you know, um, duplicate resources, etc. And really one of the keys here is best practices. We're going to be talking about a whole swag of best practices. Engaging in inspections, and engaging in other types of peer reviews, engaging in continuous integration, mechanisms that, that allow for better estimation of how long things will take, putting into place good testability investments. Testability to ensure that your system is testable. And that may sound hard to do. It's not hard to do. You divide it up so it's testable. On certain systems, like an Oculus space system, it might be harder. But it's very doable. Okay? Um, putting in place good testing infrastructure, good mocking, using assertions um, to, to test assumptions in the code. Um, creating the code in a way that's easily understandable and, and many people can reason about, not just it's creative. Many, many things you could put in place that will lower vulnerabilities through best practices. And we're going to be sketching in the next few lectures. It's kind of like, it's, it's kind of greatest hits of best practices. It's like a lot of the material from this course boiled down into some quick comments. And I put some up. Okay, I'm not going to go over them exhaustively now. That's for shortly. Okay. Um, right. Um, people issues will come up during the course. There's a conflict between the test lead and the development lead. Or within the tester team, only one person is pulling their weight. Or in the tester, you have a coding cowboy who says, this is my code, and don't you dare touch it. And uh, you know, keep your filthy hands off of it. Um, I'm going to be the one who leads this project. We've had all those pathologies before. And nature is not kind <laughs> to, to those sort of situations. A lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of lost opportunities um, uh, are at hand. Uh, people issues are key. Come talk with me more. Talk with our TA, our TA Dale Fu, uh, located over here, a veteran of this course, a very successful course, delivered a great deal of value on the, the testing side in a, uh, a very good uh, project outcome. So talk with us. Talk with us to, to brainstorm how do I handle this? How do I handle someone who's gone, you know, AWOL, gone out 
absent without leave. We don't know what they are. They haven't responded for three weeks. Let me know. We have actually an escalating series of warnings. There's the yellow card and the red card. And we've been letting people know they're at increasing risk of failure. They have to talk with me as soon as possible. But a lot of that has to be handled internally, right? You don't want to be launching the red card at someone in whatever form, unless you have to, right? Um, you want to be able to bring them on side. You don't want them to feel so embarrassed they don't even show up to your meetings anymore and they kind of slink off. Um, believe me, it's happening. Um, many times. Too many. Um, so, you know, you should bring, bring things up to me and really it's about taking the project management um, seriously. Okay? There's a huge variance in project experience. I've mentioned that. Okay. Um, TAs are here to offer assistance, assistance of multiple sorts. Technology assistance in terms of a bit of advice, um, um, uh, specifics associated with um, dealing with people problems, uh, issues that might come up on the continuous integration side. Dale is someone who's just come back from uh, Yen, where he participated in a large, uh, a large set of ecosystem really of, of uh, open source projects that involve um, databases at, uh, and, and uh, larger mainframe systems at IBM. So um, he's a great person to talk to. Please use him as a resource. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, a couple more things here before we dive in. Um, here we go. Oh, okay. That's it. So those are some comments uh, up, up front about the course. Um, any, any questions that I could answer about this? I will note that if you go look at the syllabus, the due dates for all the incremental deliverables are given. The due dates for your presentations about the incremental deliverables are also listed. Okay? Um, each of those is laid out uh, quite clearly. Um, and you should assume that those are fixed. I can't remember any time I've taught this course and we've had to change the time of that. Certainly, if it did occur above a decade ago, I don't remember that. Um, so the syllabus also lays out expectations about projects. And I will be posting, in the next few days, a set of project descriptions. We're getting some in right now from external stakeholders. And Depending if we'll have enough out of those, I may, I may elaborate with some that I feel are good projects for, of my own devising and that are appropriately scaled and, and, and scoped. Okay. So um, by the end of the weekend, there should be a collection of projects. I will be randomizing the teams. The teams are selected in this class randomly. Judging by the numbers here, there'll be two or three. If there is anyone in the room who is not yet registered, please either register immediately or send me mail or both so that I'm aware of that so I can assign you as well to the teams. We're looking for teams that are between 8 and 12 people each. The experience is materially different if we go outside those numbers. So, um, so please let me know as soon as possible. If you will be randomizing teams. I plan to assign teams by tomorrow. So please let me know if you are here and you're planning to take, or you're intending to take the course, you're very likely to take the course, but you're not registered. Because otherwise, I'll need to go off the registered list of students, which may be small. Okay? Um, by contrast, you will have to choose the accountable kind of positions for your team. These include project manager, build master, test lead, development, and someone scanning for risk, probably not on a, uh, on a, on a uh, full time basis, but on a, on a partial basis. There might also be someone who is in charge of documentation and coordinating all the pulling together that is needed for the deliverables. Okay. So uh, you'll have to self organize in your teams about those things and get to know each other, get to know each other's skills, background, what you're bringing. Um, so descriptions of a lot of this are in the syllabus. Please, please, please.
go through. I want to really show this before diving into best practices here. Please, please, please go through the, on the uh, syllabus, which you will find, um, I go through a set of expectations, okay? It's under the project area towards the top. It's before the, the listing of specific lectures. Um, in this area, I go through on a point by point basis through expectations for project adherence to practices and processes for this course. These do include things which will have a very material impact on your day-to-day -day experience. For example, all of the projects will be open source projects located on GitHub. They will be located under the collection for this course, and I will be providing you the links to those GitHub repos for each team so that you can start to populate them and configure them as you see fit. Um, we will, by contrast, provide uh, a lot of flexibility when it comes to the particular technologies. Perhaps you want to use React or React Native. Perhaps you want to use Angular, you know, Angular 3. Perhaps you want to you know, put in place mechanisms using Google Flutter for cross-platform development for apps. Um, maybe you're interested in, a, in a, an Oculus project uh, using virtual reality on the Oculus uh, VR system. Um, I'm okay with all those things. You have to pick the technology suitable. Be very cautious about just choosing things that you know from some other area and you hope maybe will work. Um, you want to pick things well suited to the project at hand um, and the stakeholder needs. Um, by contrast, I will be stipulating practices for continuous integration. Um, I expect people to be, to be refreshing to get results of others, uh, others' check ins at least once a day. I expect before you check something in, before you go commit to get your changes, you need to get other people's changes that have occurred in the meantime and make sure your anticipated contributions don't conflict with them. Because if they do, you check them in, you've broken the build. You've, you've made it so cool. You will need to have a continuous integration build environment. Uh, maybe some of you want to use uh, Jenkins, or some of you will use Travis, which is a pretty uh, good um, good mesh to the needs. Um, maybe others of you will use Hudson. Um, I'm not too particular about that. I can tell you about what's worked for other teams. Um, but there's a set of expectations that are very particular here on a lot of different matters. These include requirements. These include use of assertions. These include use of specifications describing what code does, not merely um, uh, all the details of the code. It includes the success of incremental deliverables. It includes mechanisms for mocking and these continuous build regimens, um, et cetera. Okay? Please go through these extremely carefully, because there's lots of things in there you might otherwise miss. Like, each one of you needs to undergo an inspection sometime in the term. Sorry, let me, let me say that again. Each one of you, the artifacts produced by each one of you need to undergo the inspection. You're not undergoing the inspection, it's your artifacts. You're being, the artifacts are being judged by the peers on the team. And uh, you folks should be using at least once per incremental deliverable, you should have some measure of peer review involved, whether it's a desk check, prepare programming, or what have you. And I'd like to see things documented. So there's a lot of things about what I want to see documented there. Test matrices and, and uh, tools that, that document traceability, the links between certain tests and certain requirements. I want to see requirements for that. Lots of things. Please go through the very first. This is not fluff. This is core needs. And if these are not met, we'll be asking at the time of the first deliverable, well, well, where's the list of requirements? And it, it won't be an excuse to say you didn't read this. Okay. So please go through these things carefully. Um, bullet by bullet with your team. Okay. 
You notice the emphasis on test-driven development. Have you folks had an introduction to test-driven development? What class? 370? Yeah. Okay. Um, so 370, uh, you folks would have taken it with, how many people took it with Professor Duchin? How many people took it with Professor Roy? Okay. Okay, so that's very helpful because they're somewhat different in emphasis. Uh, but I think both of them should have delivered that, um, that good understanding. Okay, um, and hopefully the mix will allow for, for sharing of, of, of understanding. Um, documentation of tests, etc. So a lot of things in here, please read it carefully uh, and go through it with your teammates and make sure those um, gating what goes into the deliverables, make sure these needs are met. So first, I want to pause for any questions about this before we dive in to best practices. So questions about the course. I recognize some of you are here for course shopping. Welcome. Um, you're, this may not be a course for everyone, but this course is heavy. It is not like death march heavy. <laughs> um, this course, I would say, requires more hours than something like 340. It requires a lot fewer hours than something like a lot fewer hours than something like 332. <laughs> <laughs> But students get into this more, these are projects over which you take ownership. These are projects you are building where you leave your mark. These are projects that stakeholders want. These are projects that you may have dreams of taking forward into a, a product on the market or a project that you can turn into an open source you know, community. People get into these things. And you know, every semester, there's some people who say, look, I don't have a really heavy load. I'll be the project manager for this. Or, you know, I'll take the lead software development-wise. And they just learn gobs of stuff. So it is one of these courses you can put more effort into than, than, uh, than just a course that has very defined, limited objectives. Um, but often it's a labor of love. I mean, people, people put it in because it, it, you know, it's something that's, Realizing their vision of a project. Um, okay, um, so some people may may find it too much for them, um, uh, but it is a project where um, you get to call a lot of the shots about the design, the, the elements you want to see, the technologies you work with, etc. Okay, questions. I haven't got many questions this far. Questions. Go to the list of, um, so here's a bunch of deliverables, but if you go to the list of tutorials, there's actually, so this is the main sort of schedule and coverage of materials, but here's the tutorials, okay? The one above it is lectures, this is tutorials. And you'll notice that a fair number of these tutorial dates are things like um, formal inspections, team meetings, okay? Um, the formal inspections, you notice it says inform instructor TA material and location. So the T 
Satya and I need to be able to attend the, the listed inspections here, okay? We want to know when, when their inspection is taking place there so we can drop by and, and get a sense of are things kind of going on track? Um, does there need to be some guidance given, et cetera? Um, and so that will be part of our roles again. I'll do some of it. The TA will do some of it. The TA and I tend to spend a fair bit of time talking with teams who come to us um, about things like, how do I test an Oculus project? No. I'm building this thing in Unity, and how do I test it? There doesn't seem to be documentation about this. Or, you know, how do I do mocking in React? Or how do I do effective unit testing in, in React Native? And when you come, we expect you to have done some homework, but we'll often talk with you about this. That doesn't mean we're always experts in the technology, but we'll help you walk you through, okay, what's available, okay, let's go see, okay, you probably are misunderstanding what's needed there, maybe we can adapt to this, and we come up with ideas. We brainstorm and we, we often come up with viable solutions. Um, so so that's, that's also the role of TA. Now there's, there's another critical role of the TA, which is actually one that takes a lot of time. This course, ladies and gentlemen, is very different from any other course I know in this department, because first of all, I participate in a lot of the tutorials, normally faculty, you know, go to tutorials, and it's, it's TAs, and, or you know, lectures, um, and, uh, not the, the core faculty who do that. But the second thing is, um, we mark this course uh, for these five deliverables. And this is a very intensive thing. Every team here, maybe it's gonna be three, maybe it's gonna be two, um, um, uh, depends on how many people are, are signed up, et cetera. Um, I spend a lot of time marking these things. But five times a term, for every one of the projects, I try to look at everything submitted. TA does this along with me. But not only do we do it along with me, we ask representatives of each team to come in and talk with us. Because we found that sometimes we're going over these materials and maybe it refers to a test matrix, but we can't find the test matrix. Did you do a test matrix or not? Well, it's referring to it, but there's nothing in it. We don't want to just say, no test matrix, taking you for that. We want to be able to have a discussion. Oh, what's going on here? You know, do you have unit testing or not? Um, like, why, why is this so weak in terms of the documentation of these tests? We will give feedback as well, very direct feedback. And then we sort of write it up and, and, and you know, assign an overall mark and we send it back to you, okay? Um, that's my job, each team, five times a semester, okay? Takes a lot of time, but it's part of my dedication to this course. And, uh, uh, the TA, Dale, here will be participating in those and will be talking with you, engaging with you about your progress. And this is a chance for you to talk to us about issues, too. Like if there's something that's just not working, you're, you're having real trouble with these two technologies playing nicely, despite all that's said online about it. Um, we're there to help you. This is our chance to kind of know about and get you back on. Okay. So that goes on, uh, and the TA uh, will be helping, and sometimes we have breakout sessions. I remember last year, we had a team that was stuck at a technical issue. There was a student who was looking desperate. He was just banging against this thing. He couldn't get it going. The deadline was approaching. So I, the TA, and a couple of students from my lab on campus were up with him till 11.30 at night. We worked from like 5 to 11.30 um, to, to to nail it. Yeah, nailed it. And and you know, after that, it was great. It was it was it was very good. I and mean, they had a very happy stakeholder and, and you know they're anticipating rolling this out much more broadly across the province for the health authority, etc. So it's a good good thing. Um, uh, so so those are some of the roles of the um, other questions? One thing we're going to do this year, it's going to be a lot of fun. Dale's going to help with this. 
So all these projects are open source. We've had, so let me be clear. The projects when built well in this world can be really good. We have some great ones. You're interested. We have a great Oculus visualization system for data. Um, we, have, we have others that, that have come out of this that have gone on and inspired many things, inspired companies. But we did have a problem with companies exploiting students. They were so good that companies you know, sent some fresh blood. I mean, they, they came and they wanted to sponsor projects without giving credit to the students. Let me be very clear. I want to be very clear about this. The people who build and, and guide these projects own it. The university does not own it. It's overwhelmingly the team that owns it. If the, the stakeholder is guiding that team closely, they have your share. And if I'm guiding it very closely to the TA, we have a bit of bit of say, but it's basically you folks are going to be owning the vast majority of this stuff that come up. Not, not the stakeholder. You, you will have the majority vote on things. The stakeholder has an important role, and they may be an enabling role going forward. And we're going to talk entrepreneurship. I'm a serial entrepreneur, launched three successful companies, and uh, I'm, I'm, it's a space I'm comfortable in. But we did insist on making this open source because we had some exploitative issues going on. We had people buying the students on the team drinks and trying to lure them into their company, and, and it was it was not a ha healthy situation. So we are insisting on open source projects that are open to the world. But you may want to rewrite it after the project, you know, in a in a in a way that could be proprietary, taken in a proprietary direction. I'm not going to stop you, but at least I don't want stakeholders just trying to grab intellectual property and saying it's my property and, and students can join if they want to, my, my company that's going to profit from this. It's not, not very helpful. Okay. So it is all uh, uh, an, an open source thing. And one thing we're going to be doing to take advantage of that, one of the reasons we did that is you folks are going to test each other's projects. <laughs> Sorry, that's <laughs> I saw those looks. Um, yeah, so we're going to have teams testing each other's projects. Isn't that going to be fun? So, so it's one thing to say, yeah, we tested our project. But it's another thing to say, yeah, we tested our project really seriously. And it has a way of happening that team A will discover issues with team B. And TB will discover issues with teammates' projects. Because all the people on team A, why would that occur? Tell me, why would that occur? Why, even if team A is really good at, at some testing, why might it occur that team B finds lots of issues? It's really fun to break other people's yeah, yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> it is fun. It is fun, yeah. Uh, you tend to pigeonhole, like, sort of put blinders on yeah. for issues you know were there, but don't. Exactly. You, know, you, you, you kind of, oh, yeah. Well, of course that's going to be fixed, you know. Um, or, uh, yeah, we all knew about that, and, you know, um, you know, yeah, it's handled. <laughs> you know, we know about it. Or, or you just assume, you've all come to group think about this issue, that this software's going to be used in this way, and then someone hits it with, you know, a, a different set of assumptions, you know, uh, and and it violates your assumption about how it's going to be used effectively. Well, of course you're going to access it on a mobile app, right? Or from a mobile phone. Um, or of course it's only for screen sizes of a certain size. Or yeah, you're going to have at least this version of Microsoft Internet Explorer, you know, to, to access it or whatever, right? So there's often within a team actually a sort of tacit understanding about, you know, how this is supposed to be used that just shapes people. Of course that button is to go here. So you never push it before you enter the information on the screen. You know, you enter the information on the screen, then you're supposed to push that button. And someone comes and says, boom. Okay, bad thing. You know, crap, right? Um, so these things happen very easily. Okay. Um, again, question? Okay, let's jump into some best practices, could we?
That's our expectation, sir. Okay. Um, what expectations are there to you? The first, per, is it Will? Uh, per Will's comments is the common position. Okay? This is what I'm looking for for you. Okay? Um, I think this is all spelled out in the, or some, a lot of this is spelled out in the bullet points, but I'm looking for here a couple defined old time, like, like these are the sole position they occupy for this project. Project manager, design lead, okay, um, and uh, this, this would typically be the development lead too. Say design slash dev lead, development lead. Um, a build manager or build officer, someone who takes care of the build. Normally, that's pretty intense position, so you don't want to spread it out too much um, because you have these five deliverables, and each deliverable may weave in different technologies or different configurations, etc. So this is evolving. I mean, how many people here have used Git together with automated build scripts? So every time you check in, it runs builds, and it lets you know about the build status, and lets you know about failed builds, and, and gives you feedback about uh, test paths, um, code style checks, perhaps, um, uh, deploys to database, wipes the database, and, and maybe pushes it out to a test server. Um, these are, are common, common needs in industry, but um, a lot of times people in 371 haven't come across. If you have, that's awesome. It's a real asset in that regard. Uh, so we, we are expecting that. And, and you gotta configure builds for this. Like, that doesn't just happen. You gotta, you know, you gotta set up these build scripts. Um, and you gotta have some mechanism of handling, you know, the database deployment some mechanism of, of feeling, handling, kicking off the tests, and maybe having a regression test suite that you can trigger outside of the normal build process because it takes longer. You gotta kick off the, the UI-based testing as well as the programmatic testing where you're, you know, you're running code to test it that calls this function, calls that function on a system-wide basis versus something that clicks to that. Cement or what have you, right? It, it, same thing hold for a mobile app. It's a little bit different in its details. Um, and the build master is going to be involved in this. They're going to be helping to broker all these things and setting these build scripts up, and handling the, uh, the dependencies between them, what depends on what, right? Folks, back to 2.14, you remember make scripts, right? You said this thing depends on those things, and so this a.h file has changed, you've got to recompile this and this and this. Um, once this module is recompiled, this one has to be relinked. I mean, it's basically that taken to a whole other level, right? With build scripts. Say Travis build scripts, not wind on the okay? um, And you're gonna need someone on the testing team, you're gonna to have to have dedicated uh, testing lead and testing. Testing is not something you do on the side of the desk. It has to be done not only by the developer, notice how I said that, not only by the developer. Does the developer do testing? Yeah, do testing, great fun. Unit tests, the developer takes the lead. Do they do all the testing? No. Why don't they do all the testing? Why don't have developers doing all the testing? Anyone? No. We, we tend to test for uh, rational input in a lot of cases, exactly. and we don't think like end users which Beautiful. Okay. Test, so by and large, developers test in a sympathetic way. They test to prove that code works. Good testers test in a, in a way to make it break. And there's a famous test team at IBM. Yeah well before Dale's talk, um, uh, that was called the Black Team. And they were famous for their cackling laughs and, and sort of um, dressing in black and you know, having, having slanty eyebrows or whatever. And 
And they were famous because they claimed that, you know, give us any piece of code and within 30 seconds of testing it, I can break it. And people would bring their code and submit it. And it was not a nice thing. I don't, I don't encourage that. Um, although, good testing is an admirable art. And it's a different thing than a de good developer. And so you're going to want some testers who are, tested. they're not junior developers. They're not, you know, would-be developers. They're, their job in life is to break it, to, to find the, it's to find the issues. When I say break it, I'm, 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 I'm oversimplifying that. They're finding quality issues. What other issues might there be besides a bug? figure out how to put something in there that you really don't want. Good, excellent. So security related factors. It's not a bug per se. Um, Super. Your name again? Mesa. 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 Thank you. Um, I, I have problems with this. Um, eventually it's Mesa. Thank you. Um, uh, other issues that are not bugs but are real quality problems. There will just be Sorry? Bad user. Terrible user interfaces. Bad user interfaces. That's right. Mm -hmm. So user interface is just painful to use. Remember, testers are often the first power users of your system. Testers are the ones who are hour after hour using your system. And <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. You know, I have to wait a minute before the screen refreshes and and the colors, I can barely read on a small, you know, I can barely read the text on a small screen and so on. So user interfaces, usability issues, UX issues, user experience issues are, are, are really big concerns. Yeah. I, I was going to say as well, um, scalability. Um, yeah. Like again, the things like with a web server, you can test on your own. Is it fast? Is it fast about 150 people on the same web? That's right. Or, and when you most need that? is often when it's most stressed, right? You, you, you get people hearing of your company for the first time because you had a, a grand launch and you've got 150 people from a crowded conference room down in Regina hitting your website and it crashes. You know, great software and problems. Um, that's not a good thing. It doesn't get moved away. Warm and fuzzy, right? Um, and then others see bizarre error messages, you know, saying, you know, it's not you, it's a me, or, or you know, it says, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, server error or something like that. Um, and it's it's very bad stuff that can happen. It's very embarrassing, and it happens often when we most need it to perform because people are finally interested in our products, right? Um, yeah, so there's a lot of things that aren't, aren't bugs, but testers give, give understanding of things that are just flaky, that sometimes it's, it, it just, it, it has this delay before doing them that can lead you to re-enter this, this field unnecessarily or what have you. Um, you think it didn't submit, but it did. And so you end up going through it again. Sometimes you do a double submission. Um, so testers are, are, are really valuable. And then there's, there should be a part-time triage in place. Someone who, when it's getting tight and you've got to figure, is this feature going in it or not? Do we leave it out? Uh, it's kind of flaky. We don't want us to, to see it. Um, they're the ones who, you know, can be designing this. Um, I, I will note that it's a risk officer. Risk officers are very important. They're looking for new risks coming about and materialization of risks that were identified earlier. Um, so, so at the beginning of your project, I ask you to identify top risks. Give me a couple risks that might apply for 271 teams. Reliable, um, across the board. You don't have to be technology specific, across the board. What are some risks that might apply to virtually all teams? Yeah. Um, or like people being unfamiliar with whatever language or framework that they Yeah, yeah so a lot of the team is, <laughs> Is, is unfamiliar and therefore unable to make good progress in, in contributing to code. It can be a serious issue. 
particularly if people, if one person has a pet language they want everyone to learn and people just don't have time and they're struggling with it and only one person is expert enough to shape, to shape it well, yeah. I don't know about that personality clashes. Big, big time, big time. Um, and, uh, and it's not something which is preordained. There are things that can help, you know, help head it off or help sense it early in diffuse situations. Uh, but, uh, and there are things that can almost drive it um, in terms of uh, certain relationships. Sometimes pairing a tester with a developer, like, my job is to test your code, buddy, and um, and there can be adversarial relationships that come in um, in that area. Um, so good. Uh, other, yeah. Ambitions in your requirements. Sorry. Ambition in your requirements. Yeah, too, too much ambition. Sort of saying we're going to go play this. We're going to do way too much and do overpromise and are unable to deliver. Remember this. You see a lot of statistics out there about failure of software projects historically. You know, 80% of software projects come in over budget and over schedule, or statistics like that. Just be aware that those statistics do reflect the fact that developing good software within the sign triangle is hard. But they also reflect often bad judgment about what's an appropriate schedule for this project. Same project, same deliverable, may be judged unsuccessful because it's judged against an unrealistically short schedule expectation imposed on that project. Like the manager says, how long is this going to take? And the tech lead says, well, I think it's going to be you know, uh, two to four months. And, and the manager says, that's too long. How long is it going to take? <laughs> well, you know, maybe we could do it in, in you know, uh, six weeks to two months. That's still too long. You'll do it in a month, and I'll give you twice the number of people to do it. Bad news. <laughs> and then it fails to deliver a month, and guess what? It's just a failure. You know, it's over budget. It's over schedule. Well, okay. So it. My point is. The metric by which it's judged as success or failure or someone, it's, it's, it's a contrived metric, or it's an artificial metric. It's not a given thing that it's a success or failure. It's a success or failure against a certain judgment which is often flawed. Same thing with cost, you know, unrealistic expectations and ideas from managers. You know, if I give you more people, you can finish sooner. And it's just like bricklaying, right? I give you 100 bricklayers, you could do it 100 times as fast as one bricklayer. What's the matter with you technical folks? You know, you, you, you don't do people, do you? Um, uh, I gave you all the resources. It's on your shoulders to have it succeed. Horrible. Horrible. It happens. Um, it's also a way of shifting the blame from the manager. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, to software, setting expectations is often something key. And so, you can sometimes have expectations arrive on a software project, um, uh, like about requirements or, or about uh, the expectations about timing. And the project would have been judged a success if you had just been more constrained about what you promised or about when you promised it. But instead, it's judged an abject failure because the customer is counting on I'll be able to show it at my, you know, at this conference coming up. And they, they build these plans around it, and then they get dashed. Whereas if you had said in the first place it's going to take six months, it was like, oh, okay, you know, I can deal with that. Too bad it won't be available for the conference, but we'll do it next year. So human theater often is unkind to, you know, um, project plans that are, that are off base. Um, okay, so um, project manager here is responsible for a number of things, okay? Responsible for scheduling, handling. So I remember my first software company I founded. Um, 
ran for a number of years, uh, quite successful. Good, a lot of clients, uh, good cash flow, et cetera. Um, uh, that, that project, uh, that, that involved um, uh, a lot of software deliverables. And we hired a, a president for it who was a former IBM executive. Okay. He had run large projects at IBM. And one of the things that struck me about him was, forcibly, was, was um, he was very efficient in the leader, but in a way he led from behind. So he was, he was always asking, what can I do to facilitate your situation? He wasn't saying, thou shall do this, or get your body gear, or you're going to be, you know, let go, or, or you know, um, uh, you better deliver this, or, you know, your salary is cut, or whatever. It was, it was very much, um, how can I facilitate your work? How can I help you do your job better? What would it, what could I do? What's the single thing I can do in the next week that would let you be less worried about this foremost thing you brought up? Um, and so they're, they're facilitating. And I saw this again and again as my career as a developer in large companies and small. It's that, it's that facilitation. It's removing worries on the part of the team. Buffering issues so that they don't have to worry about it. Um, letting them focus on getting their job done or, or, or handling issues. Um, so handling what I call user interfaces here, which is a terribly ambiguous term, but what I'm talking about, dealing with the client, dealing with the end user, not having the end user call each developer in turn, but the project manager setting expectations, setting the, um, uh, the, the um, the sort of priorities with that they call the negotiating if there's change needs uh, with them in light of the broader project, et cetera. Assigning many milestones to people, um, coordinating meetings uh, and, and scheduling, um, helping to make sure things get done. Look, you gotta turn in these deliverables five times. The project manager's job is to make things sure things don't fall through the cracks, make sure things aren't duplicated, right? So you don't have two people doing the same work. Um, or they're, they're doing work in a way that is each good, but it won't match together. You know, it makes they're totally different assumptions. It's using incompatible technologies. So they're taking ownership of making sure this comes together. Um, and they might not do all the documentation. That might be someone else in the team that takes on that documentation role. But their job is to make sure things get done, they get looked after that you know, the, all the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. That's the job of a good project. That takes time. I remember some projects where there were people who a lot of their contribution to the project lay along these lines. And you know, some people sniffed at it. You know, they didn't do any software development. Yeah, but they let everyone else develop a lot more effectively. They scheduled, they, they scheduled the meetings, they kept morale high by bringing food, they, they did bug, organized bug parties to allow people to find the bugs. Yeah, they weren't you know, writing, writing code, but they were sure as heck successful in terms of driving the project forward in a big way. And they got rewarded when it came to you know, contributions to the project. And this is why it requires thinking a little bit outside the box of people's uh, contributions. This is some roles of the project manager. Project manager is fundamentally a point position of responsibility. They are the person who deals with the stakeholders. Most important. Stakeholders should have one point of contact. One of the worst things that ever happened to me in my, my uh, industry positions was when we had an end user who had my number as a developer. And then we'd call him the op and say, we need this feature. I'd say, okay, but I'm working on something. We need it. We need it by tomorrow. And they start telling me about why they need it, about their organization, change for organizational priorities. And meanwhile, I'm like, you know, I talk to my project managers, let me, let me have this. This shouldn't be bothering you, shouldn't distract you. I don't want this to get in the way of work. And as my project manager said, he's the one who can say, okay, this is going to cost you this. I can't, I don't know what it's going to cost. I don't know what the agreement is right now, and I can't say how much extra it's going to cost. I can't say how much extra time or what the what the implications are in terms of um, sorry run a virtual machine um, uh, 
uh, what the implications are in terms of you know, other features they've requested. You can only do this or that. That's the project manager's job. The project manager's job is to handle those big issues and say, okay, we're going to, in the end, I've listened to all the voices, we're going to need to do this and, and put the emphasis on this and help settle conflicts is another way. Yeah. I was going to say, like, one of the things that is really difficult is, like, especially if the your stakeholder is not, uh, not techie at all. Yeah. Um, like, but just a for instance, when I worked in Geekspot, I would get quite, like, there'd be times where you tell someone, oh, we got to wipe your computer because, you know, everything's screwed. Yeah. This is just too much to get rid of. Uh, well, right. Well, reinstall all your programs. Right. Uh, if you have the license keys. And the, the question I got next in far too many instances was, what's a program? Right. And the, the thing is, it, that, is the, that is the end user. It's not like yep. our generation, but we'll deal with people like that. And, like, I, you know, working with my boss, like, trying to figure out for software requirements, what they actually want. Right. And it's a huge learning curve because they don't talk like, they're talking another language. And they, what they want and understand is like, you know, the joke of like the, the never quite communicating with your clients correctly is right. all too real and like really scary when you deliver something and it's like, that's not what I wanted at all. Totally. And it happens. And if you're delivering very frequently, it's less likely you'll get that big surprise. Like, this is totally a hop in the end, right? But those different languages are key. And the project manager's need is to cross that language. Barrier. They need to know enough about the meaning of what the, the end client, how they speak, so that they can communicate to both sides of the equation, to the project manager, to their team. And that requires time. And that time is like gold, because it can mean the team not going down a rabbit hole and only finding later they're doing the wrong thing. So that's a lot of the job of the project manager. I'm going to be providing you with all these slides, a whole swack of them. I'd like you to take a little bit of a look at the next view. This is risk management, OK? Um, another absolutely key thing. Um, and I have a set of risks and so on, and, and some key, two key um, tools in the toolbox, contingency planning and mitigation, um, and peer reviews I'd like you to look at, OK? I'll be posting these slides before the end of the day, so by tonight. And uh, if you go look at them for Tuesday, you'll be ahead of game. Okay, and you'll be able to start planning some for your project meetings and so on. I'll be sending out by tomorrow the project teams. Just be sure to let me know if you're not currently signed up um, that you are uh, planning to take the course or very likely planning to take the course so I can add either one of the teams. Okay? Thank you very much, folks. I'll see you on Tuesday.